Good morning. My name is Liz Winship, and I'm really uh, very fortunate to be asked to speak to you all because I know you're all very creative. I'm not. I just want to let you know that I have two daughters that were Brownie and Girl Scouts, and I, with their badges, stapled their badges onto their sash. <laughs> So I just want to let you know that I don't know how to do any needlepoint. I don't knit. I can talk, sort of. I don't walk very well anymore either. But I can certainly give you some fun information about Nantucket, Nantucket looms, and how I got involved with it. But I'd like to sort of say that it could be almost like a game. If you have any questions, any dates, you know, just ask, and I'll try to help you out. Um, I'll give you a background. I actually went to work at Nantucket Looms in September in 1974. And I jokingly said I was like the man who came for dinner. I never left. <laughs> I was hired for two weeks. And what uh, were you hired to do? Uh, uh, basically just on the floor. Not, I, I always jokingly said that if I was a weaver, we'd been long out of business. <laughs> so, and there was, I was taught to weave. And there was a, front, uh, a loom in the front window where they used to weave placemats. And I would sit there, and as soon as somebody came up to the window, I'd get up and leave because I didn't want anybody to watch me. <laughs> so, um, so I started to work for Bill and Andy, Bill Euler and Andy Oates, in September 1974. After a few weeks there, Bill said, you can't go back to his summer job if I'll keep you on year round but you have to be back on the, you know, stay with the business year round. Because it would be more seasonal. Things a lot of times in Nantucket were. You'd work in the summer really hard and then go away in the winter. So what happened is I had this chance of like year round job. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So that was what started my relationship in getting to know Bill Euler and Andy Oates, two wonderful, wonderful men that changed not only my life, but actually a lot of people's lives here in Nantucket. Bill and Andy were all business partners as well as partners in life. They actually met, and this is where it all really becomes really pretty and fun, is that they met down the street at Mrs. Tutine's wood box. Mrs. Tutine, they used to call a Madam, her Madam Tutine, had a wonderful, wonderful uh, not only uh, year-round or um, bed and breakfast, but also they were known for their food. And she would go to New York on the off-season, and Bill Euler, who studied hotel management from Michigan, this is in the mid-50s, late-50s, Mrs. Tutine would come in, and he was the receptionist at the plaza. And she fell in love with Bill. He was charming, he was good-looking, big man and convinced him to come to Nantucket one summer and be the front of the house at the wood box. So that was said, well, okay, I'll try it, why not? So then Andy Oates, who actually was, he worked at the very bottom of Fair Street, which is now uh, Pacific National Bank, but back then it was the, uh, before it even was this trust company, it was also a gallery, and I think it was by Peg Kelly, it was Cockeyed Dove. Andy was in Boston at the time. He came to Nantucket for the summer to run the gallery. So for extra money and free breakfast, he worked buttered toast up at the wood box <laughs> and, and helped refinish furniture for Mrs. Tutine. Well, Bill and Andy met, and that's where the story begins. So that uh, late, so this must have been in the late 60s or 50s, and the, um, what happened is that was really pretty interesting is that Walter Beinecke, with his dad, started this amazing vision of starting the Nantucket Historical Trust, and they really wanted to uh, see Nantucket sort of return to its glory days. And their big, one of their biggest projects was to take, which is now the J.C. House, but at the time was the Ocean House, and make it into a really like five-star hotel. And they would come, Walter would come with his wife, Mary Ann Beinecke, and they actually would stay at the Woodbox. And with that, one night, 
uh, Walter and Mary Ann asked Bill and Andy to come sit down and have a cup of coffee with them after dinner, and uh, basically Mary Ann uh, sparked a dialogue with the two men and asked what, you know, they saw Nantucket, their vision, and that sparked a very long-lasting relationship between Mary Ann, Andy, Bill, and Walter. Walter, of course, being more into the financial part and the restoration of getting the hotel going, but Mary Ann was an amazing visionary that wanted to really bring crafts back to Nantucket. So that was pretty much, they think, about 61. So then what happened, just to give you an idea, that in 1968, the Inquirer and Mirror wrote an article, and it said uh, about, of course, it was later into the whole, uh, the business really getting going, but they said that about uh, Marianne and Bill and Andy and Walter, that the one evening of conversation turned into a planned project that might help restore the economy on Nantucket. They were really interested in trying to make it be like almost like a Williamsburg instead of just sort of a little, you know, like a, five, you know, people come over on the boat, you know, with the lunch in their bag and go home without their lunch in the bag. This would actually encourage people to want to shop and bring in the crafts and the talents that were here on the island. So, uh, Mary Ann talked to Andy about weaving, and Walter said, what would be your, your dream if you had a dream? And he said, I would love to have a weaving studio on Main Street in Nantucket. And Mary Ann was like, bing! And she had, because she had amazing knowledge of weaving and fabric design, and, real, and she knew she found somebody that really could match her vision. Andy went to school uh, in the now defunct Black Mountain College in Swannanoa, North Carolina. And he studied under the renowned Annie Albers, who was a German teacher of weaving as production instead of just a craft. So you were learn, instead of doing just a piece at a time, you would do yardage or you would do uh, blankets. And he, she really, really was an amazing, from the Baja School, teacher. He then proceeded to go on to uh, graduate from Rhode Island School of Design. So then uh, Bill, again being into management, hotel management, he originally got a job when the Jared Coffin opened. But then move ahead a few years, and in 1962, the Historical Trust formed, and I hope I'm getting this right, because this is where I learned a lot from just talking to Andy while he was weaving at the loom. I obviously, in the beginning, in the 70s, there was not a lot going on in that shop. <laughs> Matter of fact, nothing. <laughs> so I would go back and talk to the weavers and start picking their brains, and especially Andy, and he was telling me the back room of the looms, which was at 16 Main Street, were what they did, they would weave on big Maycomber floor looms. And so you could, it wasn't something, it was loud, but it wasn't really loud. So you could stand at the edge of the loom and me, who would talk to a gnat, would just ask him all these questions. And he was really wonderful in giving me a lot of the stories. So move ahead and they, the uh, historical trust started two affiliated divisions which I didn't realize for a while, but it was, I always thought it was just under the Cloth Company of Nantucket, but no, it was Nantucket Looms and the Cloth Company of Nantucket. Those are the two that really worked out of 16 Main Street. The Cloth Company, and it, but what was interesting about the Cloth Company was that it was uh, a, basically uh, Doris and Leslie Tillett out of New York City were wonderful silk screeners and designers. And what they did is they made where now the sunken ship and the Rosen Crown is right across from the Whaling Museum. That was one of the last, it was like a big warehouse, and it was the last, what they call rope walk, where they actually would make the rope out of hemp for the whaling ships. Big open things that they could stretch it all the way down and have it all the way come back. And that was open. It was 
obviously not being used as a rope walk anymore, so the cloth company set up big silk screening uh, machines that they would then hand print fabrics. And there are still a lot of fabrics, and I think they're down at the Historical Association to be shown. There was Nantucket wildflowers, there were the uh, cranberries, there was uh, sail uh, whaling scenes from a uh, sailor or a woman on the wet widow's walk looking out for her husband. As, and so they would print these things and then they would go ahead and sell it at the shop. But the, now with Nantucket looms, that was, they were hired mostly to do the fabric for the Jared Coffin House. The fabrics being overshots, which they went into curtain fabric, uh, um, probably bed skirts. They wove rugs for the stair runners. They did upholstery fabric for the big wing chairs. And somebody asked if there's still things that have fabrics there. And I think there still might be some, especially maybe of the cruel work on the chairs. Uh, and some of the overshots, they still might be at the, at the old part of the, uh, the Jared Coffin. So, what, in 1964, when the restoration work was complete, because I think the uh, hotel opened in 1963, and it was under Phil Reed and his wife, they ended up um, deciding that they wanted to keep the business, Nantucket Looms and the cloth company, going. They ramped up uh, a lot of training classes for island weavers. It was much easier to teach someone to weave there than um, having somebody come in and say, oh, I know how to weave. Because then, you know, it's like breaking any type of a myth you might have. And it, these were big, like I said, they're big floor looms. They started at 36 inch up to, we had at one point a big 12 foot long loom in the front uh, part of the shop. And it was mostly for upholstery fabric. So move ahead and then um, in 65, this, this is new for me. The Weavers in Nantucket, um, there was a place called Taybach Fabrics Limited in New York. And he was uh, the chairman of the company, Burwell, Charles Burwell, wrote and said they were just amazed on producing the most highly uh, quality fabrics that the, he's ever seen. And what the looms was always known for was that they always worked with natural fibers. It wasn't any, it was fine linen, it was silk, it was rammy, it was wool, it was just um, mohair, alpaca. They'd never had any type of, uh, um, like, not that it's when polyester would come along, but not that they would have even known what that was. So then in 1967, the cloth company branched out locations in, uh, to Madison Avenue. It didn't, that was, I think, the Tillots ended up wanting, the cloth company wanted to go back into New York, and um, it wasn't, there wasn't enough for things to, uh, people, although they were starting to come to Nantucket, there wasn't enough, in, you know, of a uh, pull. So they left, and then in 1968, and this is where it really begins, April 1st of 1968, Bill Euler and Andy Oates started Nantucket Looms Incorporated, at 16 Main Street. So that's when they really decided to take the art of production hand weaving into being a craft or a, and a, a very viable business and uh, were able to weave the blankets and the ascots and fabrics and um, yardage and uh, just that we would sell by the yard, hand woven wools and it was really much more of a production weaving. And there was probably, at the heyday, at least 12 weavers there. And, usually, and it's a hard thing to sit for that long and to be able to just do the same thing over and over again. I think probably I was joke saying that when um, Walkmans came around, it was the best thing for hand weavers because they finally could listen to something. So. Ah, then, um, so it was April of that year. Then move ahead six years, and that's when I moved in with him. And I, like I said, I was a man who came to dinner and he never left. And I always jokingly said, too, that I changed my husband and my home, but never my job. 
So I stayed with them, and then in 1993, they had this horrible idea of retiring and left me the actual business. But when I was there and worked for them for 18 years, I learned the most amazing uh, things from them, how to not only work and run a retail store, but how to really treat people. And I hope, I mean, I'm sure I've had moments. <laughs> and that's why I've retired, because I'm not nice anymore. <laughs> but, um, but I think that what was really amazing and what I learned is that Bill and Andy not only had an amazing uh, talent in having the beautiful handwoven products, but they also recognized a lot of wonderful talent this island had. They had people come to them with the first person, I mean, I say this now, but it's not the first person, but the, probably one of the ones under my tutelage was Susan Boardman, that she came in and was very nervous and wanted to show me her artwork or what she was going to do. What was funny is that for the longest time, I learned, and I actually learned from Bill and Andy, that you don't say no to somebody's art or craft even though it might be grandma's hand-knit little people, <laughs> used up all the you know, yarn she ever had since she was eight, you wanted to look at it because you never knew if you were gonna pass up something that would be wonderful. And this is a perfect example where Susan Boardman started. I was so fortunate that she would, came to me and was very nervous and opened it up and I was like, I wanted to say, are you? kidding me? <laughs> so it was, but then we had wonderful basket makers, Carol Lindquist, we started with John and Francis Elder, we had um, Mark Sutherland who did beautiful boat building, we had craftsmen of all types, painters, Pat Gardner who did amazing, beautiful, beautiful shorebirds, collections that people have uh, uh, from Sailor's Valentines, to just things that just would throw you for a loop because you just couldn't believe people could actually do this and wanted to do this. I mean, that to me looked like torture, <laughs> but they did a wonderful job. And we were very, the Looms was very lucky to have basically first dibs. So when they retired in 1993, they moved to, uh, they were here seasonally, but they discovered Key West, and it really, really was a really wonderful time for them. And then, and they would come back in the summer. So I ended up, when I took over Nantucket Looms, and I just was so devastated, I said to Bill, who was really my mentor, because he was the business part of it, and he, I said, and he gave me so much credit. And it had to change, too, because in the 80s, people would come in, and Nantucket was becoming an amazing destination. It had, had everything going for it. It had the ocean, the beautiful beaches, the, the history, the architecture, through the Nantucket Historical Trust and Marianne and Walter Beinecke. Look what this island had become. Now you know, in the beginning, you know, nobody liked Walter Beinecke about doing this. I'm so sorry, Julie. But everybody was like, there were things like ban the bee. You know, they didn't like the fact that he was taking over and this was what was going to happen. But he had nothing. They had nothing but really, really the heart of Nantucket in their soul. They really cared for it. And they took really good care of it. They really did. I mean, not only did they have this amazing thing with the needlework and the the gift box and Erica Wilson and all these wonderful classes, but it really changed the whole direction of this island. So when then uh, in the 80s, and it was getting busier, people would come in the looms, still Bill and Andy, very part of being uh, part of the business, would say, what's new? And I'd have to say, the help because it was like, we got to step up our game here. You know, it was like, how many ascots are you going to sell to these people? So we really started to really branch out. We, did, we were known as a signature back then of having the most beautiful hand-woven and mohair 
and brush wool chaise throws. It was our signature. Four by seven, it became the best wedding present of the world. And through that, then they went on to different ones. They go from mohair to cotton to alpaca to silk. It is just on and on. And then also, there is a woman, her name is Leah Mark, she's still alive, well into her 90s, that sewed these beautiful hand-woven, what they called CPO shirts, which were lined with 100% cotton Pima lining. And it was just why they call it you know, like a chief petty officer, but it really looked more like um, a Pendleton hunting shirt. But what they did is they had beautiful ivory buttons on it, whalebone buttons, and they were all individually sewn by just one woman, one woman. And one year, she did 365 of these shirts. And let me just say, she was German. So I rest my case. She was absolutely brilliant. And her daughter, Karen Ganga Shepard, now is also a weaver and designer here on the island, and she started at the looms. There's so many people that did actually start working at the looms. Like Carol Moffat came in for, you know, a summer in 1991 and started the friendship we've had forever. And so there's a, it really, really does spread out, and there's an amazing family that I've really gotten to be very close to and really very fortunate. But like I said, Bill said, I was, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Because I was by myself. And he said, you have to find yourself another Liz. And I go, how do I do that? Well, lo and behold, 1960, uh, 1996, Stephanie Hall, who was my sister's nanny at the time, but she did go to school for merchandising, came in and wanted a job. And I was like, wow. And it was the same thing. We were just like, there was a, I was a 20-year difference with Bill and Andy, and there was a 20-year difference with Stephanie and myself. So there was no competition. It was easy. It was very, very respectful. And the same thing happened with Becky, Rebecca Periner, who is now the master weaver at the Loom. She's actually been there and did learn an apprentice <coughs> under Andy Oates, also a RISD graduate, in 1993. So, and then... Two, I have to bring the family into it. My daughter, Bess Clark, is involved with it. So after I was there for over 40 years, it was time for a change. Just like Bill and Andy knew it needed to change, just because of the, the way the island was going and the style, although it was still going to be a wonderful opportunity to continue the production hand weaving, which, when you think of it, is the only industry really on Main Street to keep it going. So it passed it on to the three girls, just like the men passed it on to me. And although we have changed uh, locations, and probably not very comfortably when I did it, but hey, who cares? I did it. No, but anyhow, we moved, and we finally found a great home at 51 Main Street. And we have just as many weavers, if not more than I, when I was actually had the business on Main Street. And we're open year-round. We, what we do is it's really great if somebody does want to learn to weave, that if they are willing to do like a year apprentice, it's great. You just can't come in for the summer and learn to weave and then leave. But I don't have, obviously, anything to show you, but up as far as the history, but the girls have done, because as of last year, we turned 50 years, and yeah. fi which is pretty amazing. <laughs> and, and I'm so proud of that. I don't even think of it as me. I just think of it as all you people that have helped us and supported us and believed in us, that we have a great timeline upstairs that shows pictures of Bill and Andy and the Mr. Cameron, who was the, in charge of the weavers. And, People that learned to weave at Nantucket Looms and w to do the Jared Coffin. I don't know if you know Valero's on Old South Road. Warren Valero, who moved here from New Jersey with six kids, he learned to be a weaver at Nantucket Looms. <laughs> so there is a lot of really great, great history. And um, it's fun to talk about it. And I, I miss it. And I have to say, I do miss it, but I don't miss it. I miss it only in the fact that I don't see... Uh, faces like I used to and have that time with them. But now that I'm at the thrift shop, it's better. And, uh, and I see the people that, you know, really 
supported the Loomis. It's a different clientele now, which of course it's always going to ch happen. But I think that what's really pretty amazing is that I worked there for as long as I did and never, ever really thought, oh, I got to go to work. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so that's it. You were telling me about some of your clientele. Oh, yes, 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 which is really amazing. Um, be, be, uh, we were very, very fortunate, and Bill and Andy were, they had um, a patron of theirs was Bunny Mellon. And Bunny Mellon came in, and when she came in, then it was like, wow. Of course, I know who the hell she was. But um, I've certainly learned. But she was before I was there, and they did, through Mrs. Mellon, and that, of course, then Mrs. Kennedy of Nassus, uh, we had these wonderful uh, relationships, and uh, Paul and Bunny Mellon had a huge interest, as you might know, in the uh, West Wing at the National Gallery in Washington, and they had Nantucket Looms weave the fabric for the boardroom and on the walls of the uh, actual gallery, which it, we did it, it was known, it was woven in what they call Andy's fabric, linen and rammy. Rammy being um, uh, again, a natural fiber, and it was part of a plant, which was a very, it was very stringy, but it became, you know, a, a thing of the 70s, 60s and 70s. And Andy actually, close to the end of his life, he ended up receiving one, an award for uh, one of the 10 most um, renowned fabrics for the 20th century. One, he was one of the top 10, which is really amazing. And then uh, the week that I started to work there, they had what my favorite story was, they had Princess Grace of Monaco and Prince to come in. And we were told how to acknowledge her and what to do. And of course, I'm standing there like, <laughs> first of all, I never wanted to go in there because I thought it was too fancy in there. And back in 1974, you still had a little bit of that hippy-dippy thing. So I was over in the corner, and we were told that this is what you do. And this thing. So all the they come in, the whole entourage walks in, and there's Princess Grace with a Nantucket sweatshirt on and a turban. And I'm looking at her going, what? <laughs> a turban and a sweatshirt? Even back then. So, and then we had uh, Greta Garbo, we had many, many, many first ladies, uh, which was really, really very, very exciting. And as Carol pointed out, her favorite one, because she happened to be there, was Tom Selleck, who came in and had a shirt made, and he needed to be measured for that shirt. <laughs> so, <laughs> obviously that took a couple of days. <laughs> So, uh, I, think I don't know, uh, there's just some great, great, it's great stories. Some that I really can't tell you. But I mean, they did. We really had a really fun, fun time. And I really miss those men. Bill, unfortunately, passed very early. He was only 67. And he died of leukemia in 99. And then Andy went on and he, he passed in 2012. And, um, I just have such wonderful, as I said, I have just, as much as I, you know, I have wonderful family, great brothers and sisters, my own family, but they really obviously gave me this opportunity. And I have to say too, which of course, not that you want to feel sorry for me, but I have had from 99% of my life bad legs and they ended up thick and thin, <laughs> taking me back on crutches, sitting in a draftsman's chair, pulling myself around, because I'm convinced Bill didn't want to come out of that office and have to work that floor anymore. <laughs> so he was like, I'll keep you on. You just stay. We'll do anything you need. So I was really very, very lucky. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your support. <laughs>